Welcome to Craters of the Moon National Monument and Preserve in Southern Idaho in winter with the snow covered ground. Uh, winter time is actually a great time to come visit the monument even though you can't see a lot of the cool volcanic features with a blanket of snow. It's still just a, a magical time to explore this park and this area, uh, the landscapes. There's sort of a stillness and just a real serene kind of beauty uh, in this area at this time of year. So we always try to come out um, at least once during the winter, put on our cross country skis. Um, and then the road here is actually closed to cars, but they groom it, sorry, they groom the road for uh, snowshoers and skate and classic Nordic skis during that time of the year. Um, I'm here at the spatter cones area, and this is a really great spot to observe a number of volcanic features and kind of maybe look into and explain why these volcanic features are so different here and maybe get behind some of the reasons why we have such a high concentration of volcanic vents and young landforms right here at Craters of the Moon. Um, let's start with a diagram to kind of explain what we have going on here. And so this is just my little cartoon rendition of Southern Idaho. So we have the, the Snake River Plain, this swath of kind of flat to lower leaf topography dominated by lava fields and other volcanic features. To the southeast in southeastern Idaho, we have a set of mountain ranges offset by valleys running through the southeast corner of the state down by Pocatello, Soda Springs, that area. North of the Snake River Plain in eastern Idaho, we have another set of mountain ranges that are separated by intervening valleys. And these are some of the tallest mountain ranges in the state. In fact, our tallest point, Bora Peak, sits about here in the Lost River Range. We have the Lemhi Range, which has mountains over 12,000 feet. The Beaverhead Range, which runs along the Montana-Idaho border. So a lot of big mountains up there. And if we look at these, these mountain ranges here, we can see that there's an overall northwest trend to the mountain ranges in these valleys. This is part of a geologic province called the Basin and Range. This area has been produced by this section of North America being extended in more or less an east-west or kind of southwest-northeast direction. And as this cold, rigid crust has been, ex uh, has been extended, that's meant that these faults uh, have, have been created that have offset the mountain ranges, pushing one side of the fault up to create the mountains, dropping another side down. So these are a series of what we call normal faults. These are faults that are, that are extensional faults that have been created. And that's why we have such high lofty mountains in this part of Idaho. Again, you can see the same pattern and progression here in the southeastern part of the state. In fact, you might be doing what might come natural to a lot of people, and that is you can kind of take these mountain ranges, and if you kind of ignore the Snake River Plain here, you can almost see how these extend and were maybe once, con one, once a continuous mountain range across the whole region here. And of course, um, what we've had happen since this basin and range extension began about 20 or so million years ago and it continues today. We had an earthquake here in 1983, the Bora Peak earthquake, that's part of this ongoing regional east-west or southwest-northeast ex extension in this area. But what we can see here in the Snake River Plain is a series of volcanic vents in an area called the Great Rift. So these little stars are actually volcanic vents and I haven't put all of them on here, just the ones along the Great Rift and here at Craters of the Moon. But we have this part of Idaho passing over the Yellowstone hotspot over the last 10 or so million years. And that's really what sort of has forged or created sort of a blowtorch effect, I suppose, across south, south, southern Idaho that's made this topography so flat. So during that period, as we were passing over that Yellowstone hotspot, we would have big explosive eruptions, you know, Yellowstone kind of super volcanic eruptions of ash uh, inundating the landscape. And then following that, we'd have some of those volcanic features maybe collapse to form calderas. Um, and then once, once we sort of move past that stage of Yellowstone volcanism, we end up with mostly basaltic lavas, fluid lavas pouring out from vents and inundating this area. And because those basalts are a little bit more dense and heavy than the volcanic products that preceded them, that caused the Snake River Plain to sink and subside, creating this low area. And so what you can see here is that these 
volcanic vents in the Great Rift are somewhat parallel in this northwest southeast direction to these faults we see in the southeastern part of the state and just to the north of the Snake River Plain. And so what we think is going on here as geologists is we think that the, the extension of the crust is manifesting itself as faults, creating mountains and valleys on either side of the Snake River Plain. But here in the Snake River Plain, that extension as that occurs in these heated rocks and thinned crust uh, created by the passage over the Yellowstone hotspot, that it's created this volcanic uh, fissures and vents that have formed more or less, more or less parallel to that. So we think that there's a, a tectonic uh, control on the orientation of these vents here in the Snake River Plain. And as we look over here uh, to the south, we can see a series of small hills, maybe like 40, 50 feet tall, but very steep. These two cone-shaped features here, these are spatter cones. And then as we look beyond these two spatter cones, there's a, a, a much larger volcanic landform in the distance, um, maybe six, 700 feet tall. Um, that's Big Cinder Butte. And as we turn to the east, in front of us here, we've got more of a broad, low profile kind of dome shape here. This is Inferno Cone. And then swinging around to the northwest, we have another sort of steep sided landform here. And believe it or not, these uh, all these landforms surrounding me here, we've got at least three different types of volcanic vents. So starting with these small ones here, these are actually what we call spatter cones. So imagine this basaltic lava like you see in Hawaii, it's fairly fluid in the, as far as lavas go, um, but it's got enough gas content that it's throwing out just clots and blobs of lava that actually stack up around the vent uh, and sort of stick together. It actually forms a material we sometimes call agglutinated spatter or agglutinated basalt. So there's a fun word for the day. Um, and that sticky mass of lava just builds up around the vent and eventually forms this nice cone shape here. Same thing with this second one here. We've got at least two of these uh, kind of nice little spatter cones here. Then in the distance, we have this much larger mountain, you know, 700 feet tall of Big Cinder Butte. That's the single largest volcanic landform in Craters of the Moon. That's a cinder cone. And you might have seen pictures of cinder cones or um, the classic sort of textbook example of a cinder cone is like a crater on top and a much more gas rich eruption where the lava actually gets shredded into, you know, mostly uh, BB, marble, golf ball, and slightly larger clots of highly gas rich, frothy, basalt and as that piles up around the vent it builds up this big cone here so that's a classic cinder cone there big cinder butte uh, same thing if we swing around back to the looking back to the northwest this is a series of pits which you can see nicely on google earth called big craters and there's sort of two or three of these in a row um, and these are actually, again, these nice cinder cones here. If we could dig down under the snow, we'd see these nice little small marble, BB, and maybe golf ball sized pieces of cinders, these very frothy pieces of lava that have come out. But then directly across from us, we have something different. We have this kind of large, broad, low angle, gentle slope dome here of Inferno Cone. In fact, there's even a, a trail coming up the, the northwest side uh, that you can get to the top of in, in, the, in the summertime. And believe it or not, this is also a cinder cone, but it looks nothing like the classic cinder cones we see here, and it has no crater at the top. So why would this cinder cone be less steep, much more broad, less tall, and not have a crater at the summit like we see with big craters and big cinder butte to our south? And if you spend a little bit of time here, or perhaps if you look at these trees on Big Cinder Butte, you might get a little hint here as to what the answer is. Notice that a lot of these limber pines up here are tilted or are leaning to our right, which is to the east or to the northeast. In southern Idaho, we can get some strong winds that blow. And what we have here, the vent for this volcano, the actual location where the clots of lava and magma came shooting out of the sky with a little bit of gas pressure is actually just down here in the foreground, kind of between me 
and if you can make out the the road over here um, so literally like maybe 60 70 meters away is the vent for inferno cone and what happened here is this volcano erupted on a day when there was strong enough winds that as the cinders were shot out of the vent up into the sky they actually blew over and settled to the northeast to form this cone and we actually see there's a couple of uh, cinder cones here at Craters the Moon that look similar to this. We've got Inferno Cone here, another one that we can't see. Um, we might be looking at part of it right here. This kind of broad hill just to the left, a big cinder. This is Broken Top, and it also has its vent offset and near the base. So kind of an interesting uh, dynamic here where the cinder cone vent and the cinder cone are not one and the same. And so we don't get that nice centralized crater at the summit like we might otherwise. Um, we can also see from here, I didn't mention the direction, but think of the diagram I showed you. This spatter cone, this spatter cone, and Big Cinder Butte. And if we swing around and look at big craters behind me here, these are all running in that direction, that northwest, southeast direction, more or less perpendicular to uh, the extension direction here in North America. So this is part of the Great Rift. This is a series of these northwest to southeast trending volcanic vents that runs from here all the way across the Snake River Plain, which is about 60 miles across, and you can't even quite see the other side of it from this vantage point. So just a real fascinating landscape. Um, one last thing here, you might be able to pick out just over the saddle here, some bigger mountains. That's part of the Lost River Range. So that's the same mountain range of mostly folded uh, Paleozoic sedimentary rock, lots of limestones from about 300 or 350 or so million years ago and that's the same mountain range uh, that holds Bora Peak our tallest point in the state of Idaho. So just really cool landscape here. Uh, I might do a little bit more as we ski a little bit further um, but just a really spectacular time to come enjoy Craters of the Moon with its unique volcanic landscape. Coming in the summer is definitely worthwhile because you can see things much more exposed but to me, coming in the winter kind of has its own kind of beauty and you see things a little bit differently and it's just a special time to be out here. Definitely a nice place to come to get a little bit of solitude. So uh, enjoy, hopefully you enjoy this little tour of Craters of the Moon in winter time and appreciate all the support you can produce. Um, there's a donate button uh, under the video description. There's a, also one on the banner of the YouTube page. So we'll see you next time from Craters of the Moon in Southern Idaho. One last little uh, kind of addition here to the video. Um, I just wanted to show you there was finally a decent outcrop of rock to look at and it felt a little, felt a little wrong to do one of these geology videos and not actually showcase a little bit of rock. So we are um, still at the spatter cone so you can see a series of these spatter cones with big cinder butte in the distance. I've only moved maybe 30 or so yards from where I shot the main video. Um, but you can see right here some of this material that I was talking about in the first part of the video. This is the spatter once it's accumulated together. So you can see it's still basalt, it's still highly vesicular, has these gas bubbles in it, but you can see the way it just sort of like layers on top of itself. So imagine these kind of clots of just sticky lava being thrown in the air, falling down around the vent, sticking, another one sticks. And so over time, the heat and the compaction just sort of welds it all together. And so this is this material we call uh, a glutinated spatter or glutinated basalt. Um, just really nice uh, example of that sort of feature here. And you can just see it just sort of crudely layered as it just sort of accumulated on top of itself. Just kind of give you another quick view there. So just wanted to add that as just kind of a, a quick addendum to the rest of the video. Thanks for joining me. Appreciate it.